Welcome to Guide to IELTS. In this video, we'll discuss the different question types that you can get in your IELTS reading test. Knowing the question types helps you decide which questions to do first and know the right technique for each question type. Basically, it helps you find answers quickly and correctly. There are more than 10 question types in IELTS reading. To understand them easily, we'll divide them into four groups. Questions that follow the same order as the information in the text. Questions that may not follow the same order, but their answers are from one section of the passage, so the answers are close by. Third, some questions that do not follow the text order. And the last category has one question type, matching headings or list of headings. For each question type, we'll first discuss what needs to be done in that question. Second, some practical tips and strategies to approach these questions, and finally, some examples to understand how to practically solve them. Let's start. We're discussing two question types together. True, false, not given, and yes, no, not given. This is what your question looks like in the test. And following this, there are a number of statements. And for each statement, you have to figure out whether the statement is true or false or not given, or yes or no or not given. In the case of pen and paper IELTS, you need to write the correct answer in your answer sheet. In the case of computer delivered IELTS, you need to choose the correct answer. The questions are in the same order as the text. For all such questions, we read one question at a time, figure out its answer, and then move on to the next one. These question types require you to look for minute details in the passage. You're looking for information in case of true, false, not given, and opinions in case of yes, no, not given. So how do you solve these questions? First, read one question. Identify the location keywords. Figuring out the tentative location of the answer in the passage is very important for all the question types which have answers in order. So sometimes it helps to start with maybe the second or third question first if you feel their answers would be easier to locate in the passage. So once you have identified some location keywords, scan the passage. Scanning of the passage means you read quickly while looking for specific information. Once you feel you have a tentative location of the answer in the passage, go back to the question, reread it, understand it thoroughly. Remember, the language of the question is usually simpler than the language in the passage. Go back to the passage, read the relevant part. You may need to read two to three sentences to figure out the answer. The information that is there in the question in one sentence could be spread over two to three sentences in the passage. And finally, use synonyms for confirmation. That is, Try to find synonyms in the text for as many words in the question as possible to confirm your answer. Follow a straightforward rule in these question types. If every word in the statement is true, your answer is true or yes. If even one word is false, your answer is false or no. If any part of the statement is not mentioned in the text, your answer is not given. Let's try to understand this rule using this example. The question in this case says, other countries had built underground railways before Metropolitan Line opened. And this is the sentence from the passage. The answer is false because in the passage it says, the Metropolitan Line was the world's first underground railway. So no other country had built underground railways before. But if the passage mentions, the Metropolitan Line was one of the first underground railways or it just mentions that the Metropolitan Line opened on this date, the answer would be not given. Because in both these cases, we cannot say for sure whether it was the first one or not. It could have been based on the information given, but we can't be sure. So the information in the passage neither confirms nor contradicts the statement. We can't answer with true or false because we do not have enough information. However, if the passage mentions that it was one of the first underground railways and then another country had inaugurated its underground railway weeks before, the answer would be true because now the passage clearly supports the statement. Let's look at another example. In this case, the question says, overseas candidates can do all their auditions via a digital link. And this is what the passage says. 
YouTube or link to a secure website essentially means a digital link. So what we know from the passage is that one audition or the first audition can be done via a digital link. The answer, however, is false because of just one word in the question, which is all. The auditions after the first audition will have to be in person at the school. The passage says, if you are successful in your first auditions, you will be invited to attend future auditions here at the school. So which means they cannot be online or via digital link. If I remove this one sentence from the passage, the answer would be not given because in that case, we don't know about the other auditions. We just have information about the first audition and then no information after that. A crucial point to remember is that your answers should be based solely on the information in the text, not on what you know or assume. A simple example is this passage about the solar system. If the question is, the earth revolves around the sun, the answer would be not given even though I know that the answer is true because it is based on my knowledge and not on the information provided in the passage. Our second step in solving this question type is identifying location keywords in the questions and finding out the tentative location of the answer in the passage. So you may want to start with the second or third question first if you feel it would be easier to locate. For instance, in these two false not given questions, questions 34 and 35 have more obvious location keywords. They have capitalized words, abbreviations, the word first. So you might find it more efficient to look for the answer to the 34th question first and then search for the answer to question number 33, knowing that it will be before the 34th one in the passage. Let's look at a few examples now. We'll start with the seventh question. The seventh question has a capitalized word metropolitan. So I'll keep metropolitan line in mind as a possible location key phrase. Another word I'll keep in mind is countries. I could find the word country or nation or maybe even name of some countries in the passage. With this in mind, I start scanning the passage. Because the word metropolitan is capitalized, it's very easy to find in the passage. I can see that it is mentioned for the first time in the third paragraph. But there it is the name of a company, Metropolitan Railway Company. The phrase metropolitan line is mentioned for the first time in the beginning of the fifth paragraph. Now that I have a tentative location, I go back and I read the question again, understanding exactly what the question is asking. Other countries had built underground railways before the metropolitan line opened. So if from the passage, I get the information that underground railways had been built in other countries before, the answer would be true. If not, the answer would be false. And if from the information in the passage, I cannot be sure whether other countries had built underground railways before this or not, the answer would be not given. We get our answer from the very first sentence of the fifth paragraph. The Metropolitan Line was the world's first underground railway. Because it was the first one in the world, obviously no other country had built before. On to the eighth question now. In the eighth question, we again see Metropolitan Line and first day is mentioned, the number first. In the passage, this is where we had found the seventh answer. In the very next sentence, we see first day. So now I'll read the question carefully. More people than predicted traveled on the Metropolitan Line on the first day. So from the passage, I have to find out what the prediction was about how many people would travel the first day and how many people did travel. And if the predicted number was lower than the actual number of people who traveled, the answer would be true. In the passage, we have the number of passengers or the number of people who traveled on the first day. That's almost 40,000. What we do not have is any prediction about how many were expected to travel. Because part of the information that is asked in the question is not given, the answer is not given. And on your screen, you can see a list of words and phrases that help us confirm the answer. In the ninth question, there are no capitalized words. There are no numbers, but there are words like ventilation, pollution, 
tunnels. I am expecting to find at least some of these words as it is in the passage without any synonyms. So with these words in mind, I start scanning the passage first. Both ventilation shafts and tunnels are mentioned at the end of the next paragraph. So this is where it becomes clear why it is important to get a tentative location of the answer before you start going into the details of exactly what the question says and figuring out what the answer is. So from the first two sentences of the fifth paragraph, I got the answers to the seventh and eighth questions. But then the answer to the ninth one is at the end of the sixth paragraph, the next paragraph. Let's now understand what the question is saying. Ventilation shafts were used, there was pollution in the tunnels, and even after use of ventilation shafts, the pollution remained. Let's read the passage now. This sentence says, however, smoke and fumes remained a problem, even though ventilation shafts were added to the tunnels. Smoke and fumes means pollution. So the sentence in the passage means ventilation shafts were added to the tunnels, but smoke and fumes or pollution remained a problem. The answer is true. The next question, the 10th question, has a capitalized word London, but it also has a phrase in quotes, cut and cover. Anything that is in quotes in the questions will be found as it is in the passage without any synonyms being used or any change in the order of their words. The answer to the ninth question was in the sixth paragraph. I start scanning the passage after that. I see cut and cover in the seventh paragraph. So the next step, I go back to the question, understand it, read it thoroughly. A different approach from the cut and cover technique was required in London central area. In the passage, I see that center of London and capital center are mentioned in the sentence before the sentence that has cut and cover in it. This is another thing that you need to keep in mind. The information that is there in one sentence in the question could be spread across two to three sentences in the passage. So you may need to read two to three sentences properly, understand them properly to figure out the answer. That's what's happening here. The sentence with the phrase cut and cover says, the cut and cover method of construction was not an option in this part of the capital. The only alternative was to tunnel deep underground. So alternative is a different approach. Cut and cover method is the cut and cover technique. But how do we figure out which part of the capital is being talked about? For that, we have to read the sentence before this one to understand that this is the central part of London that we are talking about. The answer therefore is true. I'll be posting a separate video discussing solutions to the rest of these questions. You'll find the link in the description. We approach yes no not given questions in a similar manner. For examples, you'll find links to videos with solutions of yes no not given questions in the description of this video. The next question type is multiple choice questions. There are two types of multiple choice questions or MCQs. One where you have to choose one correct answer and the second where you have to choose more than one correct answer. It is clearly mentioned in the question if more than one answer needs to be chosen. In the case of computer delivered IELTS, you need to choose the correct answer or answers. In pen and paper IELTS, you need to write the correct answer in your answer sheet. You just need to write the correct letter. If you need to choose more than one answer, it doesn't matter what order you write your answer in. For example, in this question, the two correct answers to the 15th and 16th questions are C and E. In your answer sheet, you can write C in front of 15 and E in front of 16 or vice versa. Both would be correct. Let's now talk about some tips about how to solve this question type. The questions are in the same order as the information in the text. For all such question types, we read one question at a time, look for its answer, and then move on to the next one. So we read one question, identify the location keywords in that question, go to the passage, scan the passage for tentative location of the answer. 
Sometimes certain words from the options may also help you locate where the answer is. Once you have some idea of where the answer may be, go back to the question, understand it thoroughly. Don't just search for keywords. This can lead to errors. Remember the language in the question is usually simpler than the language in the passage. Then skim through the options. Skimming means read very quickly without going into any details. So we understand the question thoroughly, just skim through the options. Then we go back to the passage and start reading the relevant portion of the passage. When you see anything that is mentioned in the options, reread the option again, try to figure out whether it is correct or not. Elimination of the incorrect options is very important when attempting MCQs. So cross out or eliminate the incorrect options. The multiple choice questions in IELTS reading may require you to understand minute details or may require an overall understanding of the paragraph. Let's look at a few examples now. So the first question here, the 27th question is, the purpose of the first paragraph is to. As I mentioned before, the first thing we do is try to figure out the location of the answer in the passage. In case of multiple choice questions, it's usually very easy to locate where the answer is. Sometimes the paragraph number is just mentioned. Like in these questions, you can see that first paragraph, second paragraph are clearly mentioned. And even if the paragraph numbers are not mentioned, very often they are very clear names or other capitalized words, which usually makes it easy to locate where the answer could be. The difficult part in multiple choice questions is figuring out which option is correct and which option is incorrect. So in this case, we know the answer is in the first paragraph. We also know that the answer is about general information in the first paragraph. We need to understand the general idea of what the first paragraph is saying. Whenever you need to get the gist or the main idea of any paragraph, start reading the first sentence in the paragraph. Wherever you get a feeling that you understand what the sentence is saying, you stop. You start skipping information a little. So start reading parts of the sentence so that you get a vague idea of what it is saying. Wherever you see a full stop, start reading the sentence again. On your screen, you can see the first paragraph and the parts of the paragraph that I read while trying to understand the purpose of the paragraph are in a different color. The reason we do this is so that we do not focus on the details, the examples, the names. We focus on the actual main meaning of what is being said. So there are just three sentences in this paragraph. The first sentence says that generally we believe that it is the genius and the intelligence of the famous scientists which lead to discoveries. The second sentence says that this viewpoint the viewpoint mentioned in the first sentence, disregards or ignores two things. One, the previous experience of the scientists. And second, the work of the predecessors. Predecessors are the people who came before. So in this case, the scientists who came before these famous scientists. And the third sentence says that conventional wisdom, conventional is what is traditionally or generally believed. It gives a lot of importance to sudden coming up of ideas, spontaneous ideas coming up in someone's mind. I look at the options now. What is the purpose of the first paragraph? Is it to defend particular ideas? Well, certain ideas are mentioned. The first and third sentence talk about the conventional way of looking at things the general way of looking at things. And the second sentence talks about how this way of looking at things ignores certain other things, so it could be wrong. But is the paragraph defending any ideas? No, it is not. Defending of an idea would mean that the writer is arguing in favor of an idea. The writer is telling you that this is the correct way of looking at things. That is not what is happening in this paragraph. This paragraph is just reporting, like this is one way of looking at things and this is another way of looking at things. The writer is not taking any sides. Because the writer is not taking sides, the writer is not defending anything. So we cross out or eliminate the first option. So eliminate only the options that you are 100% sure are incorrect. So if I'm sure a certain option is incorrect, I would cross it out. 
if I'm even a little unsure, I would put a question mark before it. That maybe this could be correct, I'm not very sure. Option B says compare certain beliefs. Certain beliefs are mentioned in this paragraph, but is there a comparison of those beliefs? That is what seems to be missing. The first and third sentence talk about the conventional way of looking at scientific discoveries. The second sentence says that this view or this belief ignores some things. The comparison of different beliefs is missing. So we cross out option B as well. Option C, disprove a widely held view. A widely held view is something that is commonly believed. The first sentence mentioned popularly believed. The third sentence mentioned conventional wisdom. This is the widely held view. Disprove means to prove that something is false. The tone of this paragraph seems to be against this view, but nowhere does it clearly go against it. It is not saying that this view is completely false. The fourth option is outline a common assumption. To outline means to give a general idea of something. A common assumption is the same as a widely held view, which is mentioned in option C. What the paragraph is doing is giving you a general idea of what is popularly believed, vaguely mentioning that this popular belief may be ignoring some things. That is all that this paragraph is doing. There is a slight tone of disagreement in the paragraph, but nowhere does it clearly disagree with this. So the correct option is option D. In the description of this video, you'll find links to other videos where many other multiple choice questions have been solved in detail. The thing about multiple choice questions or MCQs is that these questions are usually easy to locate, but they are time consuming and they require a lot of focus. You need to go back and forth between the options and the passage to identify which option is correct. Let's start discussing the next question type now. Short answer questions. In short answer questions, you need to answer the given questions in a few words. Instruction on how many words or numbers are allowed is given and is extremely important. The instruction may be one of these. It could say that you are allowed only one word. It could say you are allowed no more than two words, etc. Let's understand these instructions. If it says one word and slash or a number, what it means is that your answer could be a single word answer, it could be a single number answer, or it could be combination of a word and number. If the instruction says no more than two words, your answer can be a one word answer or a two word answer. It cannot be more than two words. A hyphenated word is one word, not two words. And numbers can be written using figures or words. They would be considered as numbers. Another important thing to keep in mind is that you will find the exact word or words in the passage that are the answer to your given question. The questions are in the same order as the information in the text. So we read one question at a time, look for its answer and then move on to the next one. So to solve this question type, first you read one question you identify the location keywords. Determining a tentative location really helps find the answers quickly. So don't hesitate to start with the second or third question if it seems to have more obvious location keywords. With the location keywords in mind, scan the passage. Scanning means reading quickly while looking for specific information. Once you have a tentative location of where the answer could be in the passage, go back to the question, reread it, understand it thoroughly. The language in the question is usually simpler than the language in the passage. So it really helps to understand the question thoroughly before you start looking for the answer in the passage. In short answer questions, once you understand the question, you usually have some idea of what you're looking for. For example, in this question, it says, how far, so you know you're looking for a distance. Now read the part of the passage carefully where you expect the answer to be. You may need to read two to three sentences to figure out the answer. Remember, you will find the exact word or words for the answer in the passage. And finally, try to find synonyms in the text for as many words in the question as possible to confirm your answer. 
let's look at a few examples now the first question here the 11th question has very obvious location keywords there are two capitalized words dolicothi and veins so the first thing i do is i go to the passage try to find where these two words are mentioned they are mentioned for the first time in the second last paragraph now that i have the tentative location i read the question what type of mineral were dolicothi mines in wales built to extract so what the question means is that these mines were built to extract a mineral which mineral or which type of mineral would be the answer in the passage the sentence that mentions dolicothi is traces of such tunnels used to mine gold can still be found in the dolicothi mines in wales the answer could be gold but i'll read the sentences before and after this the reason is that the question says which mineral was it built for so what if the mines were built to extract mineral a but later mineral b was found there there is no mention of any other mineral before or after you could get confused by the fact that the word mineral is used in the sentences before and after but not in the sentence where dolicothi mines are mentioned and where we find the answer but the question asks for which type of mineral so we are looking for the name of a mineral the confirmation of synonyms part is a little tricky in this one because the words extraction and construction are there in the next sentence in this question it is the actual understanding of what exactly the question is asking that helps find the answer let's do the next one in addition to the patron whose name might be carved onto a tunnel as for the location we know where the answer to the 11th question is the 13th question again has some capitalized words which are mentioned in the next paragraphs the last paragraph of the passage so the answer to the 12th would be between the 11th and the 13th what the question means is the name of the patron is carved on the tunnel the name of which other person might be carved on the tunnel so this is where the answer to the 11th question is i start looking after this for words related to patron name carved and tunnel towards the end of the next paragraph is the word patrons and there are also the words inscriptions and names in the same sentence inscription means something that is inscribed or carved patron is a person who gives financial support or who pays for something so in this case the patron would be the person who is paying for the tunnel to find out the answer we do need to understand the meaning of the word inscription but we could have found the answer without really understanding what patron means in the passage it says most tunnels had inscriptions showing the names of patrons who ordered construction and sometimes the name of the architect the answer is architect and here are some words from the question and the corresponding words or corresponding synonyms that we found in the passage in short answer questions there could be more than one correct answer for example in this question here the instruction says no more than 3 words and or a number so the answer could be moss or patch of moss if the instruction had been one word only or no more than two words only one correct answer would be possible moss in the books which have ielts reading practice test this is how the answers are written so this means there are two possible answers moss or patch of moss and finally even though you do find the exact word or words that you need for your answer you could use certain variations and they would be marked correct if the answer is correct one such possible variation is a different spelling of the same word in ielts both american and british spellings are acceptable and are marked correct so the answer to this question is 6 meters you could write either of the two spellings of meters the next question type is math sentence ending in math sentence ending questions you have a list which has first part of several sentences and then you have another list which has the second part of sentences or the endings of sentences 
and you have to find the correct ending for the first part of the sentences that you are given. The answers of this question type are typically in the same order as the information in the passage, although in some rare cases they may be slightly out of order, but that's very rare. In pen and paper aisles, you have to write the correct letter in your answer sheet, whereas in computer delivered aisles, you have to click on the correct ending and drag and drop it after the first part of the question. As for how to approach this question type, you could just read one question, identify its location in the passage, figure out its answer and then move on to the next one. However, what I usually do is I glance at all the questions first, that is the first half of the statements, look for obvious location keywords such as capitalized words, etc. Identify the tentative location in the passage. Then I skim through all the second half statements. To skim means to read something very quickly without going into the details of it, without trying to understand every single word of what is there. Now read the relevant part of the passage and identify the probable answer. Sometimes once you have understood the question properly and you're looking for the answer in the correct place in the passage, the answers are quite easy to figure out. In other cases, you may need to go back and forth between the passage and the given options a few times to eliminate the incorrect options and narrow down your answer to the correct one. Let's look at a couple of examples now. In these questions, I can see that in the second and third questions, there are capitalized words. So the first thing I do is locate them in the passage. Haber-Bosch process is mentioned in section D and Pierce Flores is mentioned in section E. So in all probability, the answer to the first question should be in section C. Now I'll read the first question. Nutrients contained in the unused parts of harvested crops. And I'll skim through the options given. May improve the number of plants may contain data nine countries, may not be put back into soil, something about governments, something about damage to environment, and some mention of something being better at a global level. From the question, I keep nutrients, unused parts, and harvested crops in mind, and I start scanning section C of the passage. So here I see unused parts of harvested crops mentioned and nutrients are mentioned in the sentence before that. Now that I have the tentative location, I'll read this part of the passage closely. In the wild, when plants grow, they remove nutrients from soil. But then when the plants dry and decay, these nutrients are returned directly to the soil. Humans tend not to return unused parts of harvested crops directly to the soil to enrich it. So what these two sentences mean is that in the wild or in the forest or wherever there is no human involvement, once a plant dies, its nutrients go back into soil. But where there is cultivation, where there is farming, humans do not put the unused part back into the soil, so the nutrients do not go back into the soil to enrich it. Let's look at the options in the question now. B, D, E and F are clearly not the answer to the 18th question. The only possible answers are A and C. The answer is C because that is what is clearly mentioned in the passage. It says that the unused parts of the harvested crops, which do have certain nutrients, are usually not returned to the soil. These nutrients may improve the number and quality of plants, but that is something we can infer from the given information in the passage. It is not clearly mentioned in the passage. So the answer is C. Then we move on to the next one. Synthetic fertilizers produced with the Haber-Bosch process. So once we have done one or two of these, we are already familiar with the options. We don't need to skim through the options again. I had already searched that this process is mentioned in section D of the passage. Synthetic fertilizers are mentioned in the next sentence. Let's read the relevant part of the passage. A solution came with this process for manufacturing ammonium nitrate. Farmers have been putting this synthetic fertilizer on their fields ever since. 
I don't see any option in the questions that corresponds to this. So I'll continue reading the next paragraph. Chemical fertilizers can release polluting nitrous oxide into the atmosphere and excess is often washed away with rain. Indiscriminate use of fertilizers hurts the soil, degrading the soil they are supposed to nourish. The chemical fertilizers mentioned in this paragraph are the synthetic fertilizers which are mentioned in the previous paragraph. This paragraph basically says that the synthetic fertilizers harm the environment. And different aspects of environment are mentioned which are harmed. For example, the atmosphere and the rivers. The answer therefore is E. This was slightly trickier because Synthetic fertilizers and Haber-Bosch process are mentioned in one paragraph. The answer comes from the next paragraph. So it is important you understand exactly what the question is saying. And it is also important that you practice understanding the main point of a paragraph without going into the details. On your screen, you can see the relevant parts that you can quickly read and understand what is being said without going into the details of names of chemicals, etc. Let's move on to the next question type now, the most common question type in IELTS reading. Gap fill questions or fill in the blank questions. There are many different types of gap fill questions in IELTS reading. One is complete the sentences, where you just have single sentence for each of the question. This question type has questions in the same order as the information in the text. Apart from complete the sentences, in gap fill questions, you could have complete a table, notes, summary completion, etc. Now, according to the official information on IELTS website, these question types may have answers slightly out of order in the passage. That means maybe you could find the first answer first, then the third one, and then the second one. But the answers are very close to each other. They are from one part of the passage. So maybe from two to three paragraphs. However, in my experience, the answers are almost always in order, even in case of these gap fill questions. So when I am attempting them, I attempt them with the assumption that the questions are in the same order as the information in the text. As for what needs to be done in this question type, they are very similar to short answer questions. There are clear instructions about the questions about how many words can be used. A hyphenated word is one word. Exceeding the number of words that are allowed would mean that your answer would be marked incorrect even if it is correct. You would find the exact word or words in the passage that need to be put into the blank. So to solve these questions, first read one question, look for location keywords, Scan the passage for tentative location of the answer. Go back to the question. Understand the question thoroughly. Once you have done that, go to the location that you have identified in the passage. Read it closely to find your answer. Once you have put the answer in the sentence, the sentence should be grammatically correct. Which is why simple words such as a, and some can help you ensure that you have the correct answer. For example, you cannot have a plural word after a or an. There could be more than one correct answer. For example, there are two possible answers to this question, emissions and carbon emissions. Either of the two would be marked correct. However, only carbon would be marked incorrect. In gap fill questions, any information that is between two blanks will be there in the passage between those two answers. For example, in these questions, between the first and second answer in the passage, you will find a mention of horse-drawn vehicles and Charles Pearson. Keeping this in mind can help you save time when looking for your answers. Let's look at a couple of examples now. The capitalized word London and 1800 and 1850 mentioned in the question should make it easy to locate in the passage. So the first thing I would do is scan the passage and get the tentative location of the answer. And I find the first half of 1800s and London mentioned in the very first sentence of the passage. Once I have the tentative location, I go back to the question, read the question, understand it thoroughly. 
In the first half of 1800s or between 1800 and 1850s, something increased rapidly in London. We have to find out what increased. The sentence in the passage says, London's population grew at an astonishing rate. So the population of London increased. And we can then look for synonyms if we want to confirm the answer. The confusing part, however, is that the word increasingly is used later in the sentence. So don't just go after keywords and try to look for the same word in the passage. Understand what the question is saying. Now we move on to the second question. Between the first and second answer in the passage, I'm expecting some mention of horse-drawn carriage and Charles Pearson. Horse-drawn carriage is mentioned at the end of the first paragraph. So I can save time by not reading the rest of the first paragraph at all. Charles Pearson is mentioned in the beginning of the second paragraph. I'm expecting the answer to the second question in the second paragraph. Now I'll go back to the question and read it thoroughly, understand it thoroughly. Building the railway would make it possible to move people to better housing in the blank. What the question means is that if the railway is built, people will be able to move to better housing. Where will this better housing be? Or what will be the location of the better housing? This answer is slightly trickier to find because the information that is mentioned in one sentence in the question is spread over two long sentences in the passage. The answer to this question is suburbs. In the description of this video, you'll find link to a video which discusses all these questions in detail. The next question type is a variation of gap fill questions. Gap fill questions with options given or a list of words given from which you have to select the answer. So you don't have to find the word from the passage. You're given a list of words and phrases to choose from for the blank. These questions are more common in IELTS Reading Academic and they're usually more difficult than gap fill questions without any options given because in this case you need to first figure out what the answer should be from the passage and then select something from the provided options that means the same. The answers to these questions could be slightly out of order as compared to the information in the text but they are from one part of the passage, which means you can expect to find all the answers from within two to three paragraphs. In the case of pen and paper rails, you have to write the correct letter in the answer. So every option that you are given has a letter before it, A, B, C, D, and so on. You have to write the correct letter in your answer sheet. Whereas in the case of computer delivered aisles, you have to drag and drop the correct option in the blank. Here's a step-by-step -step method for approaching these questions. Glance at the questions for location key information. That is, identify the location keywords, words and phrases that help you find where the answer might be in the passage. Scan the passage to figure out the tentative location of the answer in the passage. Then reread the first part of the question carefully. It's essential that you understand it thoroughly. Don't just search for keywords. Remember, the language in the question is usually simpler than the language in the passage. Once you have understood the question, read the part of the passage carefully where you expect the answer to be. Remember that the information in one sentence in the question can be spread over two or more sentences in the passage and vice versa. So you may need to read two to three sentences to figure out the answer. Once you know what should go in the blank, start going through the options. If you are having difficulty identifying the correct answer, start eliminating the impossible answers from the list of possible answers given. Some of the given words may not fit into the sentence at all. Finally, try to find synonyms in the text for as many words in the question as possible to confirm your answer. One additional tip here is that it can be beneficial to recognize whether you're looking for a noun or an adjective. The list of options typically includes nouns, adjectives, or two-word combinations of an adjective and a noun. If it's a two-word option, start by focusing on the noun part first and see if it fits in the blank. Let's look at a couple of examples now. These are the questions we'll be working on. The first thing we do is identify location key information. In the first sentence of the questions, which does not have a blank, we have the word parliamentarian capitalized and also a number 1649. 
And we can also see other capitalized words in 1651 in the passage. Keeping these in mind, I scan the passage. In the passage, in the very first paragraph, I see 1651, then 1649, and then 1651 mentioned again. Parliamentarians are mentioned in the sentence that is 1649. Scots are mentioned soon after that. So I'm expecting the answer from this sentence or after this. Now that I have an idea of where the answers are expected to be from, I read the first question. Charles II's father was executed by the parliamentarian forces in 1649. Charles II then formed a blank with the Scots. So what I have to find is what did Charles II form with the Scots? Because of this a uh, before the blank, I know that I'm looking for a noun. And in the passage, the noun may have a uh, before it. In the passage, I found almost the exact first sentence from the question. After his father was executed by the parliamentarians in 1649. Later in the same sentence, Scots are also mentioned. The young Charles II sacrificed one of the very principles his father had died for and did a deal with the Scots. So Charles II did a deal with the Scots. I'm looking for a verb similar to formed, which is mentioned in the question. Did a deal means formed a deal. So the answer from the passage is deal. Charles II then formed a deal with the Scots. The next step now is identify the correct option. All the options that we are given are two word phrases, an adjective followed by a noun. When looking for each of the answers, I'll focus on the noun first. Option H is strategic alliance. Deal means alliance. Strategic means well thought out or planned with the hope of gaining something. None of the other nouns, innovation, reward, conspiracy, etc. have a similar meaning as deal. If we continue reading the sentence in the passage, we see that the deal with the Scots was in return for being crowned King of Scots. So it was a strategic deal or a strategic alliance. Let's move on to the 28th question now. In order to become King of Scots, he abandoned an important blank that was held by his father. The answer to this is from the same sentence that we found the answer to the 27th from. And it is before the 27th answer. It says here, the young Charles II sacrificed one of the very principles his father had died for. Sacrificed is abandoned. So he abandoned an important principle that his father died for. And in the passage it says that he sacrificed the principle and accepted a religion as the national religion. Principle is conviction. So the answer so the answer to the 28th question is J, religious conviction. In the description of this video, you'll find link to a video in which all these questions are discussed in minute detail. The next question type that we're discussing is diagram completion questions. Diagram completion questions are more common in IELTS reading academic. In these questions, you're given a diagram which has some labels missing and you have to label it correctly. The answers to the diagram completion questions may not necessarily be in order, but they typically come from within one to two paragraphs and the answers are usually pretty close to one another. So to solve these questions, the first thing we do is look at any titles that are given to the diagram, identify any other words that we feel could help us locate the answers easily. Based on these, we identify the tentative location of the answers in the passage. Once we have done that, we look at the first question carefully, read the relevant part of the passage, and identify the answer. Just as with short answer questions and gap fill questions, you will find the exact word or words in the passage that need to be inserted in the blank. And the instruction about how many words are allowed is clearly mentioned. When trying to figure out the answer, it's important to carefully look at the diagram as well and understand it from the description of the same given in the passage. So in this case, the first thing I do is 
try to identify where the answers could be in the passage. When I first looked at these questions, I assumed I would find the mention of Persian Kanath method and Roman Kanath shaft somewhere in the passage. But when I scanned the passage, I couldn't find any such mention. What I did see is Kanath method mentioned in the first paragraph and Persians also mentioned a couple of times in the same paragraph. Romans are then mentioned in the second paragraph and further up in the passage, Romans are mentioned again and again. From this, I get the feeling that the first paragraph may have the answer to the first diagram and the second paragraph may have answers to the second diagram. So what I first do is look at all the three questions. The first question has arrows to certain vertical structures and it says blank to direct the tunneling. The second one mentions water and local people. The third one mentions vertical shafts and earth. These are the words I keep in mind. Now I go to the first paragraph of the passage. Just by glancing at it, I can see vertical shafts mentioned and tunnel mentioned before that. So I'm pretty sure I'm at the right place in the passage. They introduce the Kanath method of tunnel construction. So they are the Persians here, which consisted of placing posts over a hill in a straight line to ensure that the tunnel kept to its root. The tunnel kept to its root could mean to direct the tunneling, which means the answer is posts, which are mentioned in the passage as placing posts over a hill in a straight line. So that is what the label seems to be pointing at. Looking at the second question now, water runs into a blank used by local people. So water runs into something, and that something is used by local people. So I keep two words in mind, water and local people. Water is mentioned a little later in the same paragraph. So let's read this sentence. Once the tunnel was completed, it allowed water to flow from top of a hillside down towards a canal, which supplied water for human use. Local people are directly not mentioned, but for human use would be for use of people who are living there. So the water is running from hillside to a canal. The answer is canal. And the answer to the third one is ventilation, which is before the second answer in the passage. So the answers are not always in order, but they are very close to each other. It's always important to understand what is being said rather than just going in for certain keywords and looking for those words in the passage. For example, for the third question, Vertical shafts are mentioned in one sentence. The answer, however, comes from another sentence which just mentions the shafts. It requires that you understand what exactly is being said. Now we move to the question types which do not have answers in the same order as the information in the text. This category has two question types. The first one, matching features. In matching features questions, you're given a list which is usually in a text box and you have to match it to a set of statements which are given in the question. This list that you're given is usually a list of names, but it could be a list of places, animals, years, etc. So as I mentioned before, usually in this question type, the list of names that we are given is in a text box and the statements are in the questions. However, we have seen the same question being asked in a different way also. As you can see on your screen, in this case, the statements are in a text box, whereas the list of names is in the question. In the case of pen and paper aisles, you have to write the correct letter in your answer sheet, whereas in the case of computer delivered aisles, you have to click on the correct option and it gets selected. Let's now talk about how to handle these questions. First, locate all the items in the list in the passage. So if you're given a list of names, locate where and how often these names are mentioned in the passage. So some names may be mentioned in two or three paragraphs. Others may be mentioned only in one paragraph. Make a note of this. Second, skim through all the given statements. Skimming means you glance at all the statements quickly 
do not try to understand in detail what is being said in the statement but just focus on the words that catch your attention next begin with the item or the name from the list that is mentioned the least number of times in the passage because this name will have the least amount of content in the passage so it is easier to handle carefully read the relevant parts of the passage look for direct quotations or statements made by the individuals mentioned in the list this doesn't always work but very often the answer comes from something the person has said directly so look for information which is in double quotes or something that says that this person said that be attentive to the use of pronouns he she and they in the passage because sometimes a person's name may be mentioned in one paragraph but in the next paragraph they could just be referred as he she or they and you may assume that they are only mentioned in one paragraph a very important instruction that you should make a note of in this question type is you may use any letter more than once consciously check whether this is mentioned or not in certain questions such as this one that we are practicing with there are three names and six questions so obviously you would use one letter more than once but there could be a case where there are maybe four names and three statements and still it says you can use one letter more than once so this is a very important instruction in this question type let's look at these questions now we have a list of three people the first thing we do is check how often and where these people are mentioned in the passage the first name that we have in the list stana pashidi is mentioned for the first time in the second paragraph and then she is mentioned repeatedly till the eighth paragraph that's a lot of paragraph hamish lo the second name in the list is mentioned in ninth and tenth paragraphs and eleventh paragraph onwards we see a mention of ivan mccoy so i'll read the content for b and c before a because there's a lot of content of a after doing this i skim through all the statements some words that i notice while doing this are underlined on your screen having done this i'll start with hemish lo because there are just two paragraphs where this person is talked about because i have no idea of the location of the answers in these paragraphs The technique I follow for reading is ideal for getting the gist of what is being said. I start reading the first sentence. I avoid focusing on names, examples, etc. Wherever I feel I understand what the sentence is talking about, I start skipping information. And then wherever the next sentence starts, I do the same thing. This way I get some idea of what is being said in each sentence. and if i feel it is in any way connected to any of the statements i read that sentence carefully hemish lo believes that the future of work will involve major transitions whole life course the traditional trajectory of full time education followed by full time work followed by retirement a thing of the past trajectory is the path so the traditional or the conventional path is full time education followed by full time work instead he envisages envisages is he sees or he predicts future a multi stage employment life with retraining multiple jobs so this immediately connects to the 39th question which says people are going to follow a less conventional career path than in the past Let us look at the words or phrases which have helped us understand this. Traditional is conventional, trajectory is path. Career mentioned in the question is mentioned as work and jobs in the passage. And the word past we see mentioned in both the passage and the question. As I mentioned before there's a high probability of the answer coming from something that a person said. In this case we see that part of the statement is in direct quotes and the other part says he envisages something which is he predicts it or sees it or that's what he comments on it the direct link to a video in which all of these questions are discussed in detail is in the description the next question type is matching information 
the question that is asked in the matching information questions is which paragraph contains the information or which section contains the information and this is followed by some statements and you need to figure out where in the passage that information is given. The passage is divided into paragraphs or sections and they are labeled A, B, C, D and so on. The difference between paragraph and section is that a section can have more than one paragraph. And this is something you need to be careful about. If the question says which section contains the information, one section may have more than one paragraph. So section A could have two or three paragraphs. In the case of pen and paper rights, you need to write the correct letter in your answer sheet. Whereas in the case of computer delivered dials, this question is given in the form of a table and you need to just click on the correct letter in front of the answer. To solve this question type, first read all the questions, identify the key information. That is the words and phrases from the question that would help you locate the answer. An important part of these questions is the first two, three words of the question that tell you exactly what you're looking for. For example, this question says, figures illustrating the rapid expansion of the palm oil industry. The key information is rapid expansion and palm oil industry. But the word figures is very important. The figures are the numbers. So I look for the paragraphs in the passage which have some figures mentioned. And then I'll check whether the figures have anything to do with the expansion of palm oil industry. Now, in case of this question, it says mention of the impact of budget airlines on airport income. So I'm just looking for any mention of this thing. However, in this case, the question says a reason why it is difficult to provide an overview of soil degradation. So now I'm not just looking for a mention of soil degradation. I'm looking for a reason why something is difficult. So the first two, three words of this question tell us exactly what we are looking for. Are we looking for mention of a person? Like it says here, a reference to one person's motivation for something. So I'm looking for mention of one person. Most probably I'll find the name of a person in that paragraph. So read the question carefully. Not just the part about what information you're looking for but also the first two, three words of the question, which tell you whether you're looking for examples or mention of a person or a reason for something, etc. Let's look at a few examples now. These are the questions we are working on. The first thing we do is read all the questions. The words that I'll keep in mind when I start looking for answers are underlined on your screen. The instruction very clearly says you may use any letter more than once. As I mentioned before, this is very important, especially because we have only four questions and seven sections and still one letter can be used more than once. At the end of this video, I'll discuss how I use all this information about different question types to decide which question type to do first. Almost always, this is the question type I choose to do last because having done the other question types of any passage, I become familiar with at least some parts of the passage and this becomes easier. Let's start with the 14th question now. A mention of negative attitudes towards stadium building projects. Negative attitudes means negative feelings or negative behavior towards something. With the 14th question in mind, I start scanning section A. On your screen, some parts of section A are in bold. These are the words I noticed as I scanned through section A. The first paragraph doesn't seem to have any mention of negative attitudes or stadium building projects. The word construction is mentioned, but it says something about before the construction of cathedrals. So this doesn't seem to be about stadium building projects. So I move on to the second paragraph of section A. The very first sentence of this paragraph says, Today, however, stadiums are regarded with growing skepticism. Skepticism means an attitude which shows that you're doubtful whether something is true or useful. So skepticism means negative attitude. The next sentence says, Construction costs soar. 
stadiums for major events, fallen into disuse and disrepair. So what I get from this is that this is about stadium projects on which a lot of money was spent and later these stadiums were not maintained and were not used. So this conveys a negative attitude about these stadium projects that are mentioned. The question says a mention of this thing. So we are anyway not expecting any details or any reasoning given behind it. Let's move on to the next question. Figures demonstrating the environmental benefits of a certain stadium. There are three very noteworthy things in this question. One is figures. I'm expecting some kind of numbers. Environmental benefits. I'm expecting some mention of the word environment or some other words which are very closely related to the subject of environment. And a certain stadium means one particular stadium will be mentioned which means in all probability, the name of a stadium will be there. So the first thing I do is I start looking for the mention of any numbers in the passage. Section A mentions an amount, 1 billion pounds, but these are construction costs. They have nothing to do with environment. Section B also mentions numbers, but these are number of spectators. That is, it is the count of the people in the audience. Again, it is not about environment. Besides these two sections, we only find a mention of numbers in section F. Section F also has names of a few stadiums. And just by glancing at this paragraph, I can see words like wind turbines and carbon dioxide emissions, which are connected to the subject of environment. So the answer here is F. In the description of this video, you'll find the link to another video which discusses these questions in detail and also other similar questions. Matching information is a very common question type in IELTS reading general training, but the way it is worded is different in this case. You'd usually get it in section 1 of reading general. What you get in this case is that in the passage you're given a list of things labeled A, B, C and so on. And in the questions, you are given some statements. For example, here you have a list of students and the subjects they chose. Another example here is a list of properties listed by a real estate agent. And here there is a list of different hiking booths. In each of the cases, the question would have a list of statements and you need to figure out for which of these things the statement is true. So the way you approach these questions is exactly the same. Just read the heading of the passage first, then go through all the questions, understand them, identify the keywords, and then start scanning the passage. And finally, we'll discuss the last question type, list of headings or matching headings. List of headings or matching headings is one of the most dreaded question types. And the reason for that is that you need to understand the gist or the main point of every paragraph to be able to identify which heading would be correct for it. Which means it involves reading more content than you would for most other question types. If list of headings is one of the question types given, then the passage is divided into paragraphs or sections and they are labeled A, B, C and so on. If it is divided into sections, it means each section could have one or more paragraphs. So when you have to identify a heading for a section, you need to take into account all the paragraphs of that section. This is important to keep in mind because if you choose a heading based on only one paragraph of a section, obviously it could be incorrect. In the case of pen and paper aisles, these paragraphs or sections are labeled A, B, C and so on. And the list of headings that you are given are labeled as Roman numbers 1, 2, 3 and so on. You need to write the correct Roman number in your answer sheet as your answer. In the case of computer delivered aisles, there is a blank space above each paragraph or section and on the right, the list of headings is there. You need to drag and drop the correct heading on top of each paragraph or section. So how do we approach this question? 
One way is that you could read all the headings first and then start going through the passage. That is not what I would recommend. What I recommend is that you get the gist of first paragraph, then go through the headings trying to figure out the correct heading. Something which is very useful in list of headings is the method of elimination. It is exactly what we do in multiple choice questions as well. Once you get the gist of a paragraph, as you are trying to identify the correct heading for that paragraph, keep crossing out any headings that you are sure cannot be the heading of that paragraph. So you narrow down your options, the chances of making a mistake reduce and you save time as well. Let's look at a couple of examples now. From the heading of the passage, I can see that the passage is about some pyramid. The first thing I'm going to do is try to get the gist of the first paragraph. To do so, I start reading the first sentence. Wherever the sentence starts making sense, wherever I'm able to understand what the sentence is saying, I start skipping parts of the sentence. Then I start reading the next sentence and keep doing the same. On your screen, you can see the paragraph and parts of it are in bold. These are the parts that I focused on while trying to get the gist of the paragraph. The first sentence here tells me that pyramids from Egypt are famous. The second sentence mentions that there are some other cultures which also built pyramids. But still, the pyramids of Egypt are more famous. The third sentence mentions that how the pyramids evolved is something that people have written about, have argued about for centuries. And the last sentence, the fourth sentence says that there may be argument about how pyramids evolved overall in the world. But in Egypt, it is known that pyramids started with this pyramid, the step pyramid of Joseph. This is the information we have from the four sentences. Now we start looking at the headings. As we go through the headings, we start eliminating or crossing out the headings we know for sure cannot be the heading to this one. So I start going through one heading at a time. Of all the headings that we have here, the only two possible options for this one could be 4th and ninth. Let's look at these two closely. The ninth one says the answers to some unexpected questions. If I focus on the word question in the heading, I see that there is a word question in the paragraph as well. But there is no unexpected question being asked here. And this phrase, there is no question that, actually means that there is no confusion about something or that it is confirmed or it is a certainty. So actually in this case, this refers to the fourth heading which says, a single certainty among other less definite facts. So the less definite facts are things that are argued about for centuries and the single certainty is there is no question that. So the answer to this one is fourth. Similarly, we move on to the next one. We focus on the important parts of each sentence. We try to avoid focusing on names or examples. The important parts of the paragraph are on your screen in bold. Having read these, I again go back to the headings and start going through them. As I go through the headings, I keep eliminating or crossing out the ones which I am sure cannot be the answer to paragraph B. In this case, the only two headings I'm confused about are the fifth one and the seventh one. And as I look closely, I realize the answer is the seventh one. In the description of this video, find the link to another video in which all of these questions are discussed in detail. Now that we have discussed all the question types, let's summarize the whole thing. Most of the question types have answers in the same order as the information in the text. In case of all of these question types, our target is always to look for location key information in the questions. Scan the passage for the location of the answer. Then read the question carefully. Understand the question and then focus on that part of the passage where we expect the answer to be. Any questions that have answers in the same order 
or even those questions which may be slightly out of order but have answers close by are slightly easier than the other question types. All the different methods of solving these question types that I have recommended in this video are just that, recommendations and suggestions. Obviously, your target is to find the answer. Practice a lot. See what method works the best for you. But certainly, knowing each question type well helps you identify that method for yourself. Most importantly, you need this knowledge of different question types to figure out which question type to do first. Whenever a passage has more than one question type, look at all the question types and decide which one you would want to do first. For example, I always choose to do which paragraph or which section contains the information question type last. This is one question type where there is usually no location key information. So once I've done the other question types, I'm familiar with the passage and this one becomes much easier. Another example about deciding which question type to do first is if you have list of headings as one of the question types. Should you do it first or not? Well, list of headings has a big positive that if you do it first, you become familiar with the whole passage, the other question types become much easier. The flip side, the negative, however, is that list of headings are more time consuming. So if you're short of time, it always helps to do some other question type like fill in the blanks first and come back to list of headings. But if you feel you have enough time, do list of headings first. And finally, practice is crucial. However, just do not practice one test after another without pausing to understand why you made the mistakes that you did. So do a practice test, correct it, go back and figure out why you made every single mistake and then move on to the next one. Just doing a lot of practice tests one after another may not help you improve your reading score. That's it for now. Hope this helped you. All the very best.